so now that we have that out of the way, um, we are going to have to do some actual logic for the first time. And this is done by an always statement. In this case, we are uh, setting it up to where it triggers on the positive edge of clock. Um, you do this by typing out always space uh, at sign and then in parentheses you put your triggering condition. Pause edge is a keyword in Verilog that signifies the rising edge whenever it goes from 0 to 1. Um, likewise you can use neg edge and that is triggered every time the uh, signal that you're monitoring falls from 1 to 0. Um, for a lot of what you're going to be doing, positive edge logic is going to be what you need. The more advanced circuits use both, and depending on what kind of thing you're trying to interact with, it may be negative only, maybe positive only, maybe both. Okay, so inside of this code block, whatever we put here gets executed, or not executed, but it happens every time that this condition occurs, every time the positive edge is encountered. And we are going to make our timer controlled by a switch where we can turn it off and on um, just for a little bit of style. So we're going to create an if statement, first one you've done. Um, we are going to check to see if the value of the switch is high, if it's turned on that is. It's completing a circuit in that case, so we get a value of 1. It's at logic high, it's full voltage. Uh, if statements work just like you expect from other languages, it's if, space, in parentheses, you put your condition, and that's either true or false. Verilog itself does not have assumed Boolean values, so if you put this, it is not going to work correctly. You have to check if it's equal to 1. In this language, if you're checking the value of something, you have to use double equals, like in C. It is not assumed based on the context, like Visual Basic, where you can use 1 equals for everything. All right. So whenever the switch is high, whatever is inside of it is going to happen, uh, we want to do two things. First of all, we want to increment the output to buffer value by 1, um, but we don't want to do it on every cycle, so we're going to introduce a delay of 2.5 million cycles between each update. And we're going to do that by checking if the value of delay is less than the decimal value of 2.5 million. If it is, we are going to increment the delay value by 1. Um, so until it hits 2.5 million, this will keep counting up 1 each cycle. You'll notice that I used a non-blocking assignment in this case. What that means is until this, uh, until the next blocking assignment, delay is going to equal its current value, not the one I'm updating it to. So let's say delay has a value of 3 whenever this line gets hit. After this point, uh, delay will equal 4. But on the next line, since it was non-blocking, if I check delay uh, again, that would still be true. Delay still has its old value until the next blocking assignment or until uh, the next cycle. Strictly speaking, it's not the next cycle, but it's after this cycle. So whichever condition gets hit first. Now, on the other hand, if I used a blocking assignment and I checked uh, the value of delay, that would be false. Delay would equal 4, since I did a blocking assignment there. I'll get more into that later if people have uh, questions about it. You might just want to experiment with it. Um, I guess the only other condition that you're likely to run into is something like this. That would be true by that point. Um, that would be false because it hit the uh, non-blocking assignment there. Anyway, we're just trying to increment this value as a delay. So if the value of delay is greater than or equal to 
two and a half million. It's going to hit our else. And whenever it is equal to two and a half million, we basically want to reset the delay. And we want to increment our output buffer by one. Something worth noting here is the fact that there is no such thing as plus equals, minus equals, times equals, or whatever in this language. You have to explicitly define um, the value of a, a register to equal itself plus one if you're trying to increment it, or itself minus one if you're trying to decrement it by one. Um, so it's a little bit different from some languages. Uh, might be familiar with, familiar to you, uh, depending on what language you're coming from. Okay, finally, we have to assign the value of our output buffer to the LED array. And that's just a very simple uh, assignment, like so. Uh, that's all you have to do to make this project work. So let's go ahead and compile it. Take note that in an initial block, um, you always use this regular equals. There's no such thing as blocking or non-blocking assignment. The same is true for an assigned statement. So you only have to worry about blocking versus non-blocking inside of uh, combinational logic like that. All right, had a couple of warnings. Let's go and check them real quick because you never want to ignore them. You'll miss very important things and wonder why your thingy doesn't work when it gets complex. You'll notice that these are all related to the switch again. Uh, that was expected. We only used one switch. It controls whether or not our thing is running. So let's go ahead and program this up. Um, whenever you go to program it, it's going to notice that the file was modified outside of the program. You don't have to reload the configuration each time. Just click yes. All right, so our new configuration has been loaded into the FPGA, and it's controlled by switch zero. That's why it's not running yet. But if you flip it on, you'll notice that, lo and behold, it begins. This thing counts 20 times a second since our clock frequency is 50 megahertz. It counts to two and a half million between each time it changes the least significant bit in our 8-bit value that we're showing as our counter. It completes in about 12 and a half to 13 seconds. Very simple project, but kind of fun to look at, and it teaches you quite a few interesting things. So until next time, I'm glad you're here with me. I hope you learned something. Let me know if you have any questions. If I glossed over anything that I did not explain in significant enough detail, please call me out on it. That's the whole point of this series, I'm trying to make this accessible to someone who isn't already familiar with how to do this. As long as you have a programming background. I'm not trying to teach you programming. Just the Verilog language.